right, this is AP Physics suggested problem set number 3.1. So this is from unit 3, but we are actually working out of chapter 4. So to kick it off, we have question 4.2 that involves multiple two-dimensional forces. And so A is just asking for the x and y components of each of the three poles. So let's just start from the top left and work around. So we have two components here. And the first will be 788 times, in this case, we'll do the horizontal part first. So this is our x component. So actually, let's just label this x. So our x component is going to be 788 now times the sine of 32 degrees, because that's how it's defined. And this is actually going to be negative in the end. So because our 32 degrees is defined from this vertical thing, we need to know that this component of it is going to be in the negative direction. So we'll end up with 788 times the sine of 32 degrees, which works out to be a negative 417.576. The y component for this will be the same deal but positive and involving the cosine instead as we've defined this angle. This vertical part will be the cosine. So here we plug that into our calculator and we have an answer of 668.262. So that's it for this vector. So let's switch colors and go to another. So going clockwise, this vector here has a positive x component and a positive y component. So our x component is going to be 985, and it is positive, so we'll leave that as such. And this time it is cosine 31 degrees because of the way we've defined our angle. So 985 times the cosine of 31 degrees works out to be 844.31. And these are all newtons, by the way. Y for this one will be the sine component, so 985 times the sine of 31 degrees. And so that will be 985 times the sine of 31, which should work out to be 507.313. And then finally, for our last step here, we have this vector, which has a negative y component and a negative x component. So we're just going to do the math here. Since, actually, since we defined our angle over here, I'm going to draw my vectors over here. So I have a component that is going in this direction and a component that is going in this direction. So this is an x and this is the y. So my x component will be 411 times now the cosine of 53 degrees as we've defined that angle. So 411 times the cosine of 53 should work out to be 247.346 and this is now negative, don't forget, because my x is in the negative direction. And for the y, I'm going to do the same thing. It will also be negative, but at this time it will be the sine of the 53 degrees. And that will work out to be 411 times the sine of 53 degrees, which is a negative 328.239. So the key here is, is get your trig correct and then just use common sense to apply a positive or negative sign where needed. Now for B, we want to find the resultant force after combining all of these. So if I want to find the net force or the resultant force, I'm going to add up all of the forces in each component. So adding up all of the x forces will be negative 417.576 plus 844.31 and then minus 247.346. So if we put all of these together, our net force in the x direction is going to be 179.5. Now we'll do the same thing for our y components. So we'll add all of our forces in the y direction. So we'll have 668.262 plus 
plus 507.313 minus 328.239. And adding all of these together, we get a Y set of components that adds up to 847.336 newtons. So these are our components. Now we just need to put them together. So we have an X component that is very slight. So this is our X component. And we have a Y component that is a little larger than that. So our net force or our resultant force, which is a vector, is going to have some angle we'll define as theta since we're in the first quadrant. So the magnitude of this will just be the square root of our X component squared plus our Y component squared, which will be the square of 179.388 squared plus 847.336 squared. And once we put this into our calculator, the magnitude for this should be 866.117 newtons. So that's the magnitude. And then to find our direction, our theta, we will have the arctangent of our y component over our x component, as that's what we have defined in our triangle. So this will be the arctangent of 847.336 over 179.388. So this theta will work out to be 78 degrees, approximately. So there you have it. This is the first question for this problem, or for this problem set. So, question 4.4. So we have a man dragging a trunk up a ramp. The ramp makes an angle of 20 degrees with the horizontal, and he pulls with a force angled at 30 degrees from the ramp direction. So we're asking in A, how large of a force is necessary for the component parallel to the ramp to be 90 newtons? So the component we're talking about is this component right here, this f of x, which is parallel to the ramp. So in order to figure out how large f must be, let's just take this triangle and pull it down. So f is making an angle of 30 degrees in the, from the direction that f, would, f of x would be in. So in order for trig to work out here, the cosine of 30 degrees would be equal to the x component over the magnitude of f. Therefore, the magnitude of f would be the x component divided by the cosine of 30 degrees. So, in order for f of x to be 90 newtons, we will just have 90 newtons divided by cosine of 30 degrees. And so, plugging this into our calculator, we have 103.9 newtons. and that is the magnitude of F. Now, B says, how large will the component Fy be perpendicular to the ramp, if this is the case? So you can do this a couple ways, but the easiest way will just be to note that in this triangle, Fy would be this side. Therefore, Fy will just end up being the magnitude of F now times the sine of 30 degrees. Or, since we know F, 103.9 newtons, times the sine of 30 degrees, which will give us a y component that is perpendicular of half that, which is 52 newtons, we'll say, approximately. So the trick here is don't get distracted by the fact that this makes another angle with respect to the ground. We only care about the components that are perpendicular to the ramp in this case. For 4.7, we have a skater that is initially moving at 2.4 meters per second on rough ice, and it comes to rest uniformly in 3.52 seconds due to friction from the ice. So let's write down some of this information. Mass of the skater is given as 68.5 kilograms. Initially moving, hence that this is V naught, so V naught of 2.4 meters per second. So it comes to rest. So V final will be zero, and the time that it takes to do this is 3.52 seconds. So what force of friction is exerted on the, sk on the skater? 
So we have V naught, V, and T. In order to know anything about friction, I know that the force that's going to act on it is going to be equal to MA. So this is the only force that's going to be acting on it, if I think about it in terms of the total forces, right? The only force acting on this thing is going to be slowing it down, right? It's moving to the right, it's slowing down. So my skater is a box, very, very fancy box. So that means that I need to know acceleration in order to figure out the force of friction. So what is that acceleration? Well, we have these three kinematic quantities. So this screams that we need a particular, um, particularly easy, actually, definition from kinematics. And that is that acceleration is V minus V naught over T. So plugging this in, I have 0 minus 2.4 over 3.52 which gives me, if I plug it into my calculator, a negative 0 0.682 meters per second squared acceleration. So now I just take this and plug it into my equation that I came up with for, with forces. So that's going to be a mass of 68.5 kilograms times my acceleration. So I'll make sure we know where we're coming from times my acceleration that I just found of negative 0 0.682 meters per second squared. And so this gives us a force of friction of approximately negative 46.7 newtons. Now the negative here is important as our initial velocity is given to be a positive value. Question 4.12 has a crate with a mass of 32.5 kilograms, initially it rests on a warehouse floor and then acted on by a net horizontal force of 14 newtons. So I'll do a quick sketch, here's a crate, here's a floor, I'm going to give it a mass of 32.5 kilograms, and then I'm going to say there is a net horizontal force, F net, of 14 newtons. So. A asks, what acceleration is produced? Well, I know from Newton's second law that the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. So this is all in the x direction. I'm not going to worry about vectors other than that. So if I want to find acceleration, I just need to know net force and then divide by mass. So my acceleration will end up being 14 newtons divided by my mass of 32.5 kilograms. So the acceleration that I end up with should be 0 0.431 meters per second squared. Part B says, how far does the cart or the crate travel in 10 seconds? So now it becomes a kinematic problem. So V initial is 0 as we're starting from a rest. Acceleration we just found as positive 0 0.431 meters per second squared. We also know that the time that elapses is 10 seconds. And what are we looking for? We're looking for a distance. So given these four things, it's clear that I want to use the second kinematic equation, which is delta x equals v naught x t plus 1 half a x t squared. So I will substitute in v naught of 0 times t, which is 10 seconds plus 1 half times my acceleration of 0 0.431 times my time again of 10 seconds. Don't forget to square it. And when I plug all of this in, oops, 0.5 times 0 0.431 times 10 squared, I get a change in position of 21.55 meters. So that's the first part of this kinematic problem. Part C says, what is its speed at the end of that time? So for here, I already know V naught is zero. I know acceleration. I know time. And now I'm looking for V final. So this indicates that I want to use the first kinematic equation, which is V equals V naught plus AT. So V naught is zero. So I will just have my acceleration of 0.431 times my 
time of 10, which is easy to do without a calculator, 4.31 meters per second. And that's all there is to this problem. So question 4.13 has a 4.5 kilogram cart that undergoes accelerations as shown in this graph here. A asks us to find the maximum net force on this cart. Well, I know that net force is equal to mass times acceleration. So looking at this, my mass is not going to be changing, but my acceleration does. So I just want to find my maximum acceleration. So it appears from my graph that the maximum value, ax max, of acceleration is 10 meters per second squared. So my maximum net force will be equal to my 4.5 kilogram mass multiplied by this 10 meters per second squared. Or my net maximum force will be 45 newtons. Part B says during what times is the net force on the cart constant? So in order for net force to be constant, that means that acceleration must also be constant. So not implies here, this should be is constant. So if net force is constant, acceleration is constant. So the only times that acceleration is constant are from the t equals 2 second mark to the t equals 4.0 second mark. Then C says, when is the net force equal to zero? So the only way for net force to be equal to zero means that my acceleration has to be equal to zero. And looking at this, it appears that this occurs at t equals zero and t equals six seconds. Those are the only times where my acceleration is zero in value. Question 4.16 involves an astronaut's pack that weighs 17.5 newtons on Earth and only 3.24 newtons went on some moon. So this is not necessarily our moon. So if you happen to know the acceleration due to gravity on our moon, we're not necessarily there. So A asks us, what is the acceleration due to gravity on this moon? So, in order to do that, we need to know a couple things. One, that weight is equal to mass times the acceleration due to gravity. And second, that mass is not going to change. Doesn't matter where the pack is, its mass should be the same. So, in order to find the mass of this object, we're going to have the weight of the object on Earth equal to its mass times the gravitational acceleration on Earth. So the mass, if we rearrange, should be the weight divided by the gravitational acceleration. So that works to be 17.5 newtons divided by, for us on Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. So the mass of this object should be 1.78571 kilograms. Now we go to the moon. On the moon, the same equation holds true, but with a different gravitational acceleration. So in order to find the gravitational acceleration, rearranging this again, we have the weight on the moon divided by the mass of the object. So our weight on the moon is 3.24 newtons. The mass of our object is 1.78571 kilograms. Therefore, plugging this into our calculator, we have a gravitational acceleration of 1.81, we'll say, meters per second squared on this moon. Now B is actually quite simple because the mass is the exact same as it was on Earth. So really, we shouldn't need to do any extra work, perhaps just rounding here, and we'll say that the mass of the pack is approximately 1.79 kilograms, as we found earlier. Question 4.23, I neglected to include the figure, so I'll have to sketch it really quickly. We have the ground, on which we have two boxes. Box A, which is large, and box B, which is adjacent to box A, and touching it. 
To these boxes, we are applying a horizontal force of 250 newtons. Box A has a mass of 20 kilograms, and box B has a mass of 5 kilograms. What is the magnitude of the force that box A exerts on box B? So, this is a nice little tricky question, but in order to do it, we need to sketch out some free body diagrams. So I'm going to sketch a free body diagram for box A. Now, I'm not going to worry about the fact that there is a weight going down, which is the weight of A, and a normal force pushing up with the same. I'm only interested in the fact that there must be a 250 newton force to the right. For box B, so this is A, for box B, I'm going to draw a free body diagram where it will have some weight. In fact, this should be a smaller weight and a smaller normal force to compensate. And there must be also some force pushing on it. So this is the force from A. And so we'll say this is the force of A on B. And pushing back, we actually have some force from B on A. Now, I know from Newton's third law that the force of A on B is equal to the force of B on A, but in the opposite direction. Now, what's happening in this case? Well, we have a couple things going on. We know that both boxes will move together. Therefore, the net force equals mass times acceleration for our system of boxes. So 250 newtons must equal the total mass of the system, which is mass of A plus mass of B, times the acceleration of A and B together. So for us, that must be, in this case, 25 kilograms times their acceleration together. So this is what we call a linked mass problem. Both of these boxes must move together if I push on box A. Therefore, with a little bit of math, the acceleration of both boxes must be 10 meters per second per second. So I'm interested, though, in the magnitude of the force that box A exerts on box B. So I'm interested in this force right here. So since I know its acceleration, I know that in the x direction, for just B, this is just B again, for just B, I'm going to have the mass of object B times its acceleration. So this net force, which is the force of A on B, must be equal to the mass B times its acceleration. And this we can get from our acceleration of A and B together, which must be equal to the each acceleration since they're moving at the same rate. So therefore, my, or my force will be the 5 kilograms I have for box B times its acceleration that we just found to be 10 meters per second per second. Therefore, the force of A on B has to be 50 newtons. So one thing that's interesting here is you can think what proportion of the total force must go toward accelerating B if both boxes accelerate at the same rate. Since the total mass is 25 kilograms, B makes up 20% of the total mass that must be accelerated. Therefore, it will take 20% of the total force to accelerate it at that rate. For our last problem, 4.26, we have a different situation with one box A on top of box B. So, I want to just practice making free body diagrams with multiple objects. So let's start with making a free body diagram for block A if the table is frictionless. And then if there is friction between block B and the table and the pull is equal to the friction on block B. So this is going to be very interesting. So let's start by just making a free body diagram for each of these and let's make them relative to each other. So let's say over here we have part A. So for block A, and block B, we're going to have two different free body diagrams. 
I know block B is going to have some pull force to the right. So I'm going to just say this is force pull. Now A is if there's no friction. So there is no other force opposing B's motion. Now, B also will have a weight. So we'll say this is weight of B. And it will have a normal force from the table on the, uh, on the block B. So this is, we'll call this force normal on B. Now, we also have the weight of block A pushing down on block B. So how do we do this? Well, we have an additional weight of A pushing down on block B. So this is our set of forces for block B. Both of these weights are going in the downward direction. Now on block A, what forces do we have acting? Well, we have the weight of A pulling it down, and we also have this normal force from B that's not pushing on A, so be careful. But we do have a normal force on A, which is equal to the force of B on A. So if you're curious what's going on here, we have the force of B on A. Now, the blocks do move together as a unit. So the only way for block A to move with B is if there is some kind of friction force between them. So since my pulling force is accelerating block B to the right and A also moves to the right, there must be some force pulling to the right. Well, what's supplying that force? In this case, it must be the force of friction between the two blocks. So this right here is our free body diagram for block A if the table is frictionless. Now B, we want to look at this again. So we have, again, block A, block B, two different free body diagrams. So what's the difference in this case? So there's some friction between block B and the table, and the pull is equal in magnitude to the friction force on block B. So what's the same? Well, the weight of B has not changed. Therefore, the normal force acting on it is not really going to change. But really, the normal force depends on both of these forces. So we also know that the weight of A is still pulling down on it, or pushing down on it. And then we have some pulling force that is still going to the right. The part that's new will be we have a friction force that is causing it to go at the same speed. So we have a friction force that will be identical in magnitude but opposite in size acting on block B so that this goes at a constant speed. Now, what does this do for A? Well, we still have the same weight. That hasn't changed. We still have the same normal force, which is opposing the weight. And if you're curious, this is still the force of block B on block A. And now, because we are not accelerating, there is actually no real force acting on block A because there is no need to accelerate it. But you say, what about friction? Well, if there were a friction force, what would oppose it? The answer is nothing. Nothing would oppose it. So, this is a weird situation where there is no additional horizontal force on block A because it is not accelerating in that direction. And there would be nothing to cancel out a force such as friction.